stream to fire up all across the fruited plains of the internet, then we're going to go ahead and get started. YouTube always takes about a couple of seconds longer than the rest of them, but it looks like we're alive and well. So let's get started, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Gruler. I am a criminal defense attorney right here at the r, &R Law Group in the always beautiful and sunny Scottsdale, Arizona, where my team and I, over the course of many years, have represented thousands of good people face facing criminal charges. And throughout our time in practice, we have seen a lot of problems with our justice system. I'm talking about misconduct involving the police. We have prosecutors behaving poorly. We have judges not particularly interested in a little thing called justice, and it all starts with the politicians, the people at the top, the ones who write the rules and pass the laws that they expect you and me to follow, but sometimes have a little bit of difficulty doing so themselves. That's why we started this show called Watching the Watchers, so that together with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency back down upon our very system with the hope of finding justice and we're grateful that you are here in with us today we've got a lot to get into happy monday by the way i hope everybody had a very lovely weekend and i know that i did I'm excited to be here with you today because we're going to be talking about space force which is obviously one of the most important things to talk about these days kind of reminds me of being an eight-year-old boy again space force Sounds very cool. We're going to talk about it because, unfortunately, for one member of the Space Force, uh, he's in a little bit of hot water over a book that he wrote. There is a lieutenant colonel, goes by the name of Matthew Lohmeyer, who was uh, suspended, fired, actually, after his superiors, supervisors, his uh, chain of command, the higher-ups, got wind that he was on a podcast talking about Marxism and about how Marxism is actually wrecking America, the world, and even potentially the military. So this guy wrote a book about it, then went on a podcast to talk about it. Military didn't like that. So he is no longer with the Space Force. We're going to take a look at what's going on there. We have a clip from the podcast that he was on, and we have an excerpt from his book that I purchased. I encourage you to do the same thing if you want to support the man. And we're going to read through some of that. Then we're going to change gears. We're going to talk about what is feeling like a lot of excitement, a lot of uh, sort of really a lot of vigor out there in the media, in particular wings. We're talking about uh, the Trump potential indictment. We are now talking about not impeaching Donald Trump. Could have think of the word there for a minute. We're talking about indicting Donald Trump. Now, he's got two potential indictments that are floating around. We're going to go through a couple of them today. We're talking about what's going to happen in Palm Beach if Donald Trump is, in fact, indicted out of New York. And uh, a lot of people are very excited about this. So we're going to, going to go through that. Then we're going to talk about Kim Potter. Remember Kim Potter? She's the officer who accidentally discharged her firearm, thought it was her taser, but ended up shooting and killing Dante Wright. This was during a traffic stop that was very very close to Minneapolis during the Chauvin trial and the shooting happened and Dante Wright sort of drove off but then died shortly thereafter. Kim Potter, the officer who thought that she was tasing the young man, actually shot him. Well, she had court today, had her arraignment and uh, not too much exciting there, but we are going to go through some of the new documents that are out because the government, the same prosecution, the same government office that was prosecuting Derek Chauvin is now prosecuting Kim Potter, and they just released some disclosure documents that detail kind of some of the information that they're handing over to the defense. So we are going to uh, go through a lot of that as well. We're excited to have you here and a part of the show. If you want to join in on the program, you can do so by going over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com. That is our support community where if you are a supporter of the program, then you can ask a question. We have a live chat that's happening right there, right now. And so if you want to ask a question, drop a comment or lob a criticism, feel free to do that over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. A lot of other things you can download there as well. You can get a copy of all the slides that I'm about to go through, download a free copy of my book, meet some great people. It's kind of the place to be right now. So check that out, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. All right, so let's get into the news of the day. Space Force Colonel was let go. He is on holiday. He got a call from Donald Trump uh, previously during his time in the Space Force. But now, because he is speaking out, decrying Marxism, he has sort of been asked to not be in the military anymore. So we're going to talk about this. Uh, here, This story comes over from Military.com. It says a commander of the U.S. Space Force unit that was tasked with detecting ballistic missile launches has been fired for comments that were made during a podcast promoting his new book, which claims that Marxist ideologies are becoming prevalent in the United States military. The guy goes by the name of Matthew Lohmeyer. He's the commander 
of the 11th Space Warning Squadron at Buckley Air Force Base in Colorado. He was relieved from his post Friday by Lieutenant Stephen Whiting, the head of Space Operations Command, love these names, over a loss of confidence in his ability to lead. Military.com has exclusively learned. The decision was based on public comments that were made by Lieutenant Colonel Lomer in a recent podcast, a Space Force spokesperson said in an email. Lieutenant General Whiting has initiated a command-directed investigation on whether these comments constituted prohibited partisan political activity. Lowmayer's temporary assignment in the wake of his removal was not immediately clear. So uh, it looks like, you know, he was fired, but then maybe not fired because he was potentially being removed and then relocated somewhere else. Apparently he got a call from Donald Trump at some point in time. So, you know, this guy's being bounced around is what it sounds like. And we're going to go through the article. We have got some clips about what the actual conduct is here that the military is not happy with. But I think mostly people are sort of, you know, comparing this to some of the other information that we have seen come out of the Department of Defense. I mean, we've been spending some time on this channel talking about some of the sort of recruiting ads that we've been seeing from the CIA in particular. Last week, we had the, I think, the homosexual man who likes to play Magic the Gathering. I think previous to that, we had the uh, CIS, uh, uh, gendered woman who was Latina and went through this laundry list of certain, uh, you know, check, check marks that she checks off. And then she proceeded to tell us that she is not just a list of check marks. So, you know, interesting stuff coming out of here, but very, very provocative. A lot of it is very political. We have people who are sort of, you know, out there saying that they are of a particular political persuasion and they have all of these ideologies and they use a certain type of language and then when somebody else does it kind of from the other side when you have maybe this lieutenant colonel who comes out and says well I think that maybe Marxism is a problem and I'm going to speak my political mind well then he's just fired right so people are looking at this and saying this is the double standard that happens we have the government itself endorsing via its recruiting ads a lot of stuff that looks like critical race theory that looks like it is promoting these different labels and these different language you know uh, particularities and it feels like what's happening now with this lieutenant is a little bit different he writes a book goes on a podcast and boom without any hesitation he's gone he's fired earlier this month Lomer, a former instructor and a fighter pilot who transferred in, transferred into the space force self-published a book titled irresistible revolution marxism's goal of conquest and the unmaking of the american military Irresistible Revolution is a timely and bold contribution from an active duty Space Force Lieutenant Colonel who sees the impact of a neo-Marxist agenda at a ground level with our armed forces, a description of the book reads. Lower Mir sat down with L. Todd Wood of the podcast Information Operation. We have a clip of this next. Hosted by Creative Destruction, or CD, to promote the book. He spoke about U.S. institutions, including universities, media, federal agencies, including the military, that he said are increasingly adopting leftist practices. These practices, such as diversity and inclusion training, are the systemic cause for the divisive climate across America today, he said. From his perspective as a commander, Loomer said he didn't seek to criticize any particular senior leader or publicly identify troops within the book. Rather, he said he focused on the policies that service members now have to adhere to to align with certain agendas that are now affecting our culture. Regarding Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, he said, I don't demonize the man, but I want to make it clear to both him and every service member, this diversity and inclusion agenda, it will divide us, it will not unify us. So, you know, he's speaking his mind now, and you know, we're going to go through some of the rules in a little bit. Obviously, I did not serve in the military, so I'm not intimately familiar with some of these rules and regulations. But you know, generally speaking, right, if you are somebody who's running a business or an organization or a team or a high school or any of those things, right, you want people to adhere to a certain code of conduct when they're a part of that institution. The military is no different. Uh, and so we want to ensure that there are standards across the board that are being enforced across the board. So if this lieutenant colonel was in violation of those protocols, was in violation of those rules, well, maybe there should be some repercussions uh, for that. And maybe the firing was in fact justified. If that standard is equally applied across the board. In other words, if all political commentary is prohibited because we have a prohibition against that, because we want to maintain cohesiveness and unity within the armed services. And so in order to facilitate and foster that environment, maybe we say certain type of conduct is not allowed. Certain types of language, certain types of speech is just going to, we're going to leave that at the door. You may do that in your place of business or on your sports team or your card club or whatever, right? There are certain rules of conduct that you adhere to, and we all pretty much accept that. But the problem here becomes when it's a different standard, when we have different agencies of the Department of Defense 
promulgating and pushing forward political ideologies or uh, interpretations of, you know, sort of applying procedure, internal procedure that is within the DOD, running them through, let's say, the CRT filter, just saying, well, we're going to we're going to modify all of our trainings and protocols and introduce all these diversity trainings uh, because of uh, we've identified this as, as necessary and important priority for the armed services. They can make make their justification for that. Now, if it looks very political, if it looks like this is something that is being done to sort of ring out certain uh, ideologies from the armed services, which many people are speculating about, I don't think that this has been forgotten. We saw what happened after the January 6th Capitol Hill riots, which I have never endorsed or ever supported any violence of any capacity. But back then, there were many people who were start, uh, in our elected Congress who were saying, well, maybe we need to question the National Guard. Maybe we don't know if some of those people are still, you know, Trump MAGA maniacs. Maybe we have to start purging that and start inquiring as to whether or not they voted for the man or they they, they donated any monies or funding or, or anything like that to an extremist cause. And there was a lot of discussion about that, about vetting the armed services and making sure that they were all in alignment with one particular concern. So here, if now we're going to be criticizing or condemning or even firing somebody who is a part of the armed services for maybe, you know, offering an alternative perspective here, one that many Americans think is perfectly valid and is in fact a better ideology, something that our, our military should adhere to. Well, now we can have a legitimate policy discussion about that because it feels like we're not prohibiting all political conduct. We're prohibiting some political conduct. And we have seen this as a problem when the government does this. It is content prohibitions. It's limiting what you can say and what you can do. And when we have the government getting in there and sort of tipping the scales on the free speech conversation, that's when the courts have a lot of problems about that. They can place time, manner, and place restrictions on your speech and your ability to participate in civic life. But when they start doing content moderation now, when they start saying, well, you can say these things, but not those things. That's when it becomes problematic. So let's listen in and look at this gentleman, Matthew Lohmeyer. Look at this guy. This guy's a handsome man. Look at this guy. Oh, my goodness. What a handsome man. Look at this face. He looks like Captain America over here. So if anybody's going to be fighting Marxism, we're happy that Matthew Lohmeyer is at the forefront of this. Let's listen to this handsome fella. My goodness. So you're in command of a unit and, and you see this uh, ideology start to be uh, permeated through the Department of Defense and in your service and in your command, I assume. So uh, you decided to write a book and to get the message out and, and I thank did. God you did. But uh, tell us that, about that process um, and, and what, how, what drove you to that process. Yeah, I suppose it never hurts to say a book's name more than once. So the book's name is Irresistible Revolution. Fantastic. Uh, and uh, we'll there's a couple the, of books. We'll have the image up here shortly. That's great. Yeah. Uh, subtitle is Marxism's Goal of Conquest and the Unmaking of the American Military. It's a bold mm -hmm. topic. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the U.S. military. Uh, Marxism's Goal of Conquest is not specific to the military either. It's uh, it's a uh, it's got Western civilization. Uh, yeah. as a target. It's yeah. got capitalism as a target. It's got the nuclear family as a target. And uh, Marxism does an exceptional job ever since it was first penned by Marx and Engels in 1848 in the Communist Manifesto, uh, mm -hmm. creating what many people have come to hear as the oppressor versus oppressed narrative. Right. It's, it's victimhood uh, mentality and ideology. Very familiar to everybody today. Beauty and brains there, folks. We're ha looking at a very handsome man who happens to have some pretty good ideas about Marxism, making sure that it is eradicated from this country. So let's go back to the article. This is, once again, from Military. Lomer told Wood, the podcast host, that the beginning chapters of the book explore the history and the foundation of the United States and how critical race theory is study how race and racism impact or are, are impacted by social and economic power structures and institution, how that plays a role. He says, the diversity, inclusion, and equity industry and the trainings we are receiving in the military is rooted in critical race theory, something we've been talking about a lot here. He says, which is rooted in Marxism, adding that it should be seen as a warning sign. In the segment on the podcast, he said his book is not political. It's meant to alert the readers to the increasing politicization of today's armed forces. 
which we have seen and documented here, some of which he said he'd seen or experienced firsthand. The Defense Department policies that spell out all the nuanced do's and don'ts surrounding politics or political discourse for active duty service members, says Jim Golby, a senior fellow at the Clement Center. He said for self-published work, the policies that may apply include DOD Directive 1344.10 and the associated guidelines discussing political activity in uniform. According to the service's standards, personnel may express their views freely, but they are still expected to uphold their branch's core values both on and off duty. And we have looked at some of this. We've talked about some of this on the show. And, you know, I've been kind of skeptical about this uh, when we see it from government agencies. Remember we saw, I think it was CISA. It was CISA or one of those other agencies when uh, Tucker Carlson was having that spat with, the uh, the the woke Marines, I think, is, is what we called them here on the show. There was some story we covered. I can't remember what it is, but they were the woke Marines. They were talking about, you know, how amazing they are and we don't need men or whatever. And there was a picture of a woman carrying a body or something, you know, running down the beaches. And Tucker had a segment about it. And he said that this is kind of insane. Maybe we should be talking about, I don't know, winning wars and killing people and breaking things and being an effective lethal force for good in the world by rooting out, you know, enemies of democracy or whatever, whatever the whatever the purpose that we as an as a nation decide we want the military to be. We should be talking about those things. And instead, we're talking about, you know, uh, you know, uh, cisgenders and, and things like that uh, and whether or not we should be using the proper pronouns throughout the military and the armed services. And Tucker, I, in my opinion, rightfully was uh, you know critical of a lot of what he is seeing out there. And when that happened, major pushback. And on Twitter, there was somebody who was sort of somebody who's on an official government website, or official government Twitter account, who was just dunking on people and sort of, uh, I, we took screenshots of it back then, but it was really inappropriate. And you're thinking, this is a, this is an official government agency. This is somebody running their Twitter account. And it says like, you know, sisa.gov or something. And they're just dunking on people on Twitter. And this, this doesn't feel right. feels like maybe this has gotten a little bit too politicized. And the military was supposed to be kind of the last apolitical branch. You know, they are country first. They are not Democrats, not Republicans. They are duty bound and they're supposed to be, you know, America first at all costs. We know that in practice, that's not the reality of how this works, but they're supposed to be. And so we all liked that little facade and this little white lie that we told ourselves. And so now that we're starting to see that fall apart, many people have issues about this. So if I was unhappy that we have other government agencies that were doing it, and now we have potentially a private citizen, somebody who is a, a uh, who is a was a private citizen in this capacity. He was on a podcast. He was writing a book. He was not speaking at an official off an official government Twitter account or speaking off you know any any official event. He was actually you know sort of promoting a book that he wrote in private. So we just want to keep those things in context. The policy guide who we talked about previously said those are fairly broad they would not prevent publication of the book but it might impose some minor limitations on the content of the book Golby said on Friday also policies associated with the service members security clearance or policy related access are usually governed by non-disclosure agreements the defense office of pre-publication and security review for example requires that all former and retired Defense Department employees, contractors, and others, active or reserve, if they had access to DOD information, then they have to submit a DOD information for public release for review and clearance. So they've got a procedure that they follow before they publish stuff. DOD information can include any work, quote, any work that relates to military matters, national security issues, or subjects of significant concern to the Department of Defense. In general, to include fictional novels, stories of biographical accounts and operational deployments and wartime experiences. Subject matters about hobby-like activities like cooking, sports, gardening, uh, it really don't even need to be reviewed pre-publication since it's not associated with an author's work at the Pentagon. So if you read the rest of this article, you're going to know that we don't, they, they, they go further and they say, we don't know whether he got approval or clearance or, or really kind of what the context was. We just sort of have the information that we went through. Very long article, so I would encourage you to go read that if you want the rest of the story. If you just want to buy a copy of the book, because you don't like Marxism either, uh, you'll find it over on Amazon, doing quite well, in fact. It's the number one bestseller in books, so he is uh, selling a lot of copies. This was published May 10th. See, he's got a couple of reviews over here. Uh, some people probably love Marxism. All these one-stars here, Marxists. 
just, you know, Leninist Trotskyites, just the worst. So they are probably, you know, knocking that down, but that's all right. I got to self ourselves a copy. Let's take a look at what's going on here. We can read, we're going to read four pages of the introduction, two slides it says here, written by Matthew Low Lomir from Irresistible Revolution says to appreciate just how disproportionate, ugly, or evil a thing is sometimes one must first comprehend what is balanced, beautiful, and good. To recognize approaching danger or impending chaos is often to have first been properly oriented to safety and order. Thus, opposites serve an important educational purpose, provide a necessary contrast, both enabling and requiring human discernment, as well as constructing a context for the exercise of free will. Ooh, that's some heavy stuff. I like it. I recently attended a weekend series of lectures on geometry that drove home these ideas to me. The simple use of a straight edge and compass allows the geometer to construct basic geometric shapes that become building blocks for the construction of other common and even more complex shapes and symbols. From circles, triangles, and squares, for example, I constructed perfect pentagons and hexagons. Using those same basic building blocks of the circle, triangle, and square, I conducted various root rectangles and measured the proportion of the golden section, the ratio of 1 to 1.618033989, which was used in the monumental archite architecture of Egypt and elsewhere in the ancient world. My brief exposure bestowed a, a heightened perception of the beauty and symmetry throughout nature and improved my discernment of disunity and the disproportionate. It was like I had acquired better eyes by which those things that were before unrecognizable to me became apparent. This book is largely about Marxism, something that is ugly and which can even be appropriately associated with evil aims and ends. But it is unlikely the reader will fully appreciate or see its ugliness for what it is unless this book begins with an examination of something that is beautiful and right, something Marxism seeks to dismantle, disrupt, and destroy. The three-part framework of this book has been constructed with that in mind. It begins with a discussion of the greatness of the American ideal, transitions to an examination of the history and overarching narrative of the Marxist ideology, and concludes by looking into the ongoing transformation of America's military culture while also providing a warning about where this country is headed if we choose not to make an immediate course correction. Marxism has begun its destructive conquest of even the United States military, its most alarming manifestation in the United States to date. This reality will likely come as a surprise to many Americans, including our military service members. This book, however, is not so narrowly focused as to only discuss the appearance of Marxist ideology within uniformed services. Becoming aware of the Marxist conquest of American society, one will never again look at things the same way. Mainstream media, social media, the public education system, including the university, as well as federal agencies have all become vessels of various schools of thought that are rooted in Marxist ideology, an ideology bent on the destruction of America's history and founding philosophy of Western tradition, specifically Judeo-Christian values, and of patriotism and conservatism. The problem has become systemic, a tragedy considering that the defeat of Marxist communist ideology was the very cause against which our nation spent great treasures of blood and iron during much of the 20th century. At the very same time that we see the proliferation of Marxist ideology, there have arisen multifarious accusations of other forms of systemic injustice, such as racism, that are wrecking civil society. That was beautifully written by Matthew Lohmeyer in the new book, Irresistible Revolution, available for your purchase and support over on Amazon right now. I didn't get paid for this. Just want to support a fellow anti-Marxist. Let's take some questions over from watching the watchers.locals.com. First in the house is Norovira says here, I partially agree with loss of confidence because an essential part of being in the space force is not talking about space force. If he talked about this and even wrote a book, it would be reasonable to lose confidence in his ability to keep things private. And there are a lot of things to keep private when it comes to space force. It is unlikely that he was fired for his ideology. He was fired for not keeping his mouth shut. That's good. It's a good opinion on that, Nora, right? Could have easily been that. So I want to take a quick look at this question. Also from Ryan, we have here, he says, could the ex commander of the Space Force have a legal case against the armed services for employer retaliation for whistleblowing on unconstitutional activity, which I would argue arises to the level of an actual conspiracy to overthrow the government, which last time I checked is treason. The real insurrection hashtag. Yeah, so Ryan, you know, I think it's a good question and I think it's absolutely worth investigating. So I'll tell you this, right? I, I am not a uh, military code of conduct person or, uh, you know, uh, 
or what are they called? JAG, right? The Justice Advocate General. They have their own military code. They have their own laws and their own regulations and their own rules. And so it's hard for me to opine on whether this was you know, allowed or not. Uh, but I can tell you that I think that if the government decided that this was a violation of the protocol, then they're probably going to be perfectly fine against any lawsuits. Now, you know, th this this guy legally, I think, may, may not have been in the wrong, but it, it, at least in terms of civilian free speech. But in terms of military code and military law, I couldn't speak to that. Also, couldn't 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 really speak to employment law because I don't do any of that either. But, you know, I think fundamentally the, the bigger question really to me is whether this was political or legitimate. I, I know I think we all know which way I'm leaning on that. Davis Park says, see, I don't think any active member of our, of our government should be able to profit profit off of books related to their occupation. But if we're going to set a standard, it should be held consistently. Drive me nuts when these laws are used to target only certain people. And that's really my part in this too, right, Davis Parks? I agree with you. You know, if, if he, if the military says you're not allowed to write books and he wrote a book, all right, well, you broke the rules. You know what the rules are. You can't break the rules. If the military says, well, it's kind of a gray area, go write a book, and he goes and writes a book, and it happens to be conservative, and he gets punished, but other people who are pro-Marx, pro-CRT, pro-liberal you know, liberal ideology, they don't get punished. Is the standard being sali uh, applied selectively? And if so, that's a problem, and I have a problem with that. I don't have a problem if the military says no books, or all books, or some books, but we're going to you know draw a hard line at what that means. Here, I'm going to guess that that's probably not the case. They probably did not like the content, was not in alignment with some of the vision that the, this current administration has, and there were some punitive repercussions that were divvied out as a result. Liberty or Death says, I remember when I was in the Army, we weren't allowed to be political. This is to campaign or disagree. That is to campaign or disagree with the president while in uniform or protest in uniform. But this seems so much more really looks like a signal of the military political purge of conservatives in the military. And I think that's what most people are, are concerned about. You know, they just don't want it to be an overly one-sided assault against any one political ideology. And, you know, and I went to, uh, I went to a, uh, an all boys high school when I was younger. And one of our rules was, is that we, you know, we were sort of men for others. We had to live under that code and that, in, that included being outside of high school, right? So our conduct, if we were going to make a commitment to this high school, then we had to make sure that our conduct was being maintained even outside of the school. And so you could get in trouble if you, you know, went out drinking and, you know, did something reckless, got in trouble, the school might throw you out for that. And I thought that that was kind of a good way to create culture and a lot of um, camaraderie to some degree. It was sort of, we were all, we were all held to a higher standard. And I think that is a good thing. I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing. I'm also a huge proponent of free speech. And so we have to balance these things out. And I'm totally great with that. I love the conversation, right? We want to balance and weigh the different factors that all go into this equation because it is an important equation. We want cohesion in the military. We want unity, but we also want people to be able to speak their minds. We want, you know, conscientious objectors and we want a lot of different opinions in the military so long as it doesn't interfere with their primary duty, their primary course, where they're they're going to serve the primary function of the military. And so if we have some rules and regulations and some different policies and procedures in place to regulate all that, the next question then is, is it being equally applied or is it looking like what we've been seeing out of this new administration where it's looking like it is aggressive against one particular group? Last question on this segment is here from Jack Alaya says, I hold all currently serving military personnel to be derelict in their duty to defend the United States so long as they observe and obey the insurgent demo-fascist government occupying the halls of power. That's a big order. Going to have a lot of... Uh, 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 that's like the whole military, right? Yeah, that's a lot of people. Well, Jack Elia, I think that I think a lot of people probably agree with you, but it is current environment. It's a good reason to go vote in 2022 and 2024, maybe to change the administration. So again, all of those questions came over from watching the watchers locals.com. Really appreciate your support. And a quick reminder that I am a criminal defense lawyer in the state of Arizona. So if you're watching this and you know anybody in our state that's been charged with a crime, we offer free case evaluations. I would be honored and humbled if you sent them our way. We'll be sure to help them out. All right. So we're going to change gears now. Let's talk about Donald Trump. Donald Trump is potentially in hot water. We're talking about theoretical indictments that are being floated around in two different parts of the country. We're talking about what's happening in New York. We're talking about what's happening in Florida and other places because there are a lot of people who are very excited about in 
indicting Donald Trump. They want to see him arrested. They want to make sure that he is not allowed to come anywhere near the levers of power again. And even though the election is done and over and Joe Biden is firmly ensconced in the White House, there are still people out there in this country that are just salivating at the thought that Donald Trump is going to get indicted and theoretically arrested. Let me give you a pro tip on this one. It's not going to happen. He's not going to get arrested. You're not going to haul him out anywhere in handcuffs because presidents of the United States don't get arrested. Right? That's just not something that happens. Uh, most of the people up in that upper echelon, they're immune from any of the rules that you and I have to subscribe to. They just kind of walk around and do whatever they want. So get used to that. Now, if you are somebody who is excited about seeing that happen to Trump, well, don't get your hopes up. If you're excited about seeing that happen to Biden or Kamala or uh, Hillary, well, we've played that game. Nothing happens to these people. They are in a higher echelon of power, both of them. And so if you think that they care about you and that somehow they are without any fault, well, I, I actually envy that. I think that's a nice way to live. I, I, fortunately, unfortunately, I cannot get there, but more power to those of you who uh, who think that. So anyways, I want to get into this story. We're going to be talking about the White House counsel. So if you recall this, there's a guy named Don McGahn who was a, uh, a White House counsel for some period of time during the Trump administration. And so we're going to talk about two different potential issues for Donald Trump. We have a potential investigation that might uncover something related to what? The Russian collusion hoax, right? This idea that he was improperly impeding, biasing the investigation against him during the first go round. And so when Donald Trump was in the White House, we had Don McGahn, who was White House counsel. And so McGahn now is sort of being hauled back into Congress in front of the House Judiciary Committee because these Democrats just can't get enough of uh, wanting to, I guess, impeach or indict or whatever Donald Trump We're on our like. 50th attempt, and here they are, they keep going. So this article comes over from CNN.com, written by Caitlin Polance, says the ex-White House counsel McGahn to testify behind closed doors about Trump efforts to obstruct the Russia investigation. Again, again, former Trump White House counsel Don McGahn will testify before the House Judiciary Committee behind closed doors about then-President Donald Trump's attempts to obstruct the Russia investigation. So we had the Mueller report. I mean, we had, we've gone through, all right, we're going to go through it again, I guess. The interview will happen, quote, as soon as possible. And a transcript will be released in the days after, said uh, the court filing. The committee members who interview McGahn can ask him about the incidents documented in the Mueller report. So you see how excited they are. They're going to haul him in. He was named in the Mueller report. So they're going to get to ask him questions about this, specifically about Trump's attempts to fire special counsel Mueller and block the Russia investigation. So Don McGahn was White House counsel. So if he was privy to those conversations, then theoretically they can ask him about that. The Justice Department can ex assert executive privilege or McGahn can decline to answer on the topics. Oh, all right. So you mean he doesn't have to answer anything or the executive branch can uh, assert privilege? All right. So you mean nothing's going to come of this? Got it. Which would essentially block House Democrats from learning the details. <laughs> okay, great. McCann served as the top lawyer in Trump's 2016 campaign and the White House counsel until fall. 2018. So this was updated. looks like uh, Wednesday, May 12th. So a couple days old. Uh, but here we had, I think this was from this morning. We have, looks like Katie Fang joins American Voices with Alicia Menendez, who is uh, over here on the left. And then we have Katie Fang, who apparently is a trial lawyer. And, you know, this is on MSNBC. So you know, take it with a grain of salt, but they're very excited about this. Katie Fang, you know, she's a news anchor, so she's got to get excited. Hey, turn it up to a level 11 and go bananas about Trump's impeachment. So I don't know if she's actually this excited or if this is just MSNBC. Uh, we're about to indict Donald Trump. Excitement could be something in between. I don't know, but they're excited about it. So let's take a watch. Well, Don McGahn, he did a little bit of a dodge in terms of being able to have to be compelled to testify. And ultimately, a federal judge told him that he had to. But this is an actual agreement that's been reached by Don McGahn's defense counsel, as well as members of the House Judiciary Committee or the lawyers for the House Judiciary Committee. A joint case report was filed a couple of days ago. It says that they've reached, quote, an agreement in principle to be able to have Mr. McGahn testify to information that's personal to him as well as information that's publicly available in the Mueller report so a lot of people are saying what katie is there really a value to this well no. of course there is because a transcript will be made available and even if it's limited to the testimony of just what is publicly available in the Mueller report he can be asked whether or not donald trump tried to obstruct the Russia investigation and yeah. whether or not the information that is contained within the Mueller report that is attributed to Don McGahn is accurate 
and correct. And, you know, people are going to unearth their Mueller report. They're going to dust that thing off. The Get it up. That it is, and they're going to want to check it out and see whether or not they're going to cross-reference whether or not McGahn's testimony to Congress is exactly what is what, what was included in well, the Mueller report. I also want to ask you. All right, so super excited. Dust out those Mueller reports, everybody. Get your copy. Bring it back out. It's Mueller time again. How much fun is this? So Donald Trump theoretically could get indicted again if Don McGahn goes in front of the House Judiciary Committee and answers a bunch of questions that he doesn't have to answer or that the executive branch can just invoke privilege to preclude him from answering the questions in the first place. So they have some sort of agreement. They're going to go behind closed doors. MSNBC is very excited about it, but I have a pro tip. Nothing's going to come of this. We have more coming from the real deal. We're talking about another incident that is taking place regarding Trump's CFO. So Donald Trump, the Trump uh, organization has this guy who's named Alan Weisselberg. Okay, he's the CFO of the Trump organization. So we have Don McGahn. That's issue number one. Everybody's excited. Donald Trump's going to get impeached. Don McGahn's going to rat him out. The whole thing. All right, got it. So we'll put a pin in that, see if anything comes of it. Then number two, we have Donald Trump's CFO. So we have the Trump organization, and the CFO's name is Alan Weisselberg. And so the, uh, the Manhattan attorney, New York attorney, district attorney Cyrus Vance is going hog wild on this case. So we've got Congress going in, and then we have this happening out of Manhattan. So it says here, tuition that was paid to a Manhattan private school is the latest target in a New York prosecutor's probe of former President Donald Trump and his real estate firm. What? So why is the Manhattan district attorney digging into a private school and funding of tuition that was paid to that private school? Did Donald Trump send his kids to a private school in Manhattan? No, because he didn't, right? He was in the White House. We know where Barron was. The office of the Manhattan subpoenaed Columbia Grammar and Preparatory School over tuition payments made for the two grandchildren of Trump Organization CFO Alan Weiss Weisselberg, Wall Street Journal reported. So we have the Manhattan District Attorney now going after two grandkids of the Trump Organization that are the CFO's grandkids. Okay, so not even Trump. We have Trump, then we have the CFO, then we have his kids, then we have their kids, grandkids, okay? So we have somebody who wants to get Donald Trump, this guy, Cyrus Vance, who's going after the grandkids. Why is he doing that? Well, he wants to see whether Donald Trump sort of funneled money down to the grandkids, and then that really should have been taxed as compensation to the CFO, okay? If, if there was some sort of, let's say the CFO made a million dollars a year, all right, well, if he made if he if he paid him 1.5 million a year, he'd get taxed on that. Well, what if he just paid 500,000 to tuition for those two grandkids? Really nice school, let's say. So, he gets a $500,000 benefit to the kids going to the school, doesn't get that money as income, so he doesn't get ta gets taxed at it. What's well, a misclassification of your finances? And so if the government finds that out, well, maybe they can go back, reverse engineer that and go get Donald Trump. So, they're going literally down to the grandkids. This the CFO's grandkids to go get the president, former president. All right, so Katie Fang, very happy about this. Very excited, here she is again. I want to ask you, Manhattan prosecutors are also still going after Trump CFO, Alan Weisselberg, the Wall Street Journal revealing they've subpoenaed his grandchildren's private school. Your sense of what records authorities are looking for and how they potentially tie back to Trump? Well, it's a twofold answer for you. One, this is a total pressure point move, right? We're going to go after the grandchildren's records. And for those people that may be turning their nose to that, guess what? You're going to try to push and push and push to be able to get what you need from a, a possible target or a possible criminal defendant. Also, they're going to see where did the money come from for things like these to be paid. And that's an important thing because you want to follow the money. And if the money can be tied to Weisselberg, who can then be tied to Trump in some way, then maybe the Trump organization and Donald Trump himself will be looking down the barrel of a federal indictment. Looking down the barrel of a federal indictment. Here's another pro tip on that. Donald Trump's not going to be looking at a federal indictment for paying his grandkids uh, or, or, or allegedly paying the CFO's grandkids some money. That's also not a thing. But very excited about it. And we're seeing a lot of this just sort of floating around on the Internet. Politico posted this back on the 13th, said Politico playbook, how Palm Beach is preparing for a possible Trump indictment. A lot of people over the weekend were talking about this as well. Palm Beach now makes a contingency plan in case Trump is indicted. So they're all 
<laughs> like super excited about it. Honey, we're going on a picnic. Get the kids. Everybody, Trump's getting indicted. Law enforcement officials in Palm Beach County have actively prepared for the possibility that Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance could indict former President Donald Trump while he's at Mar-a-Lago according to two high-ranking county officials. Among the topics discussed at those meetings are how to handle the thorny extradition issues that could arise if an indictment moves forward. An obscure clause in Florida's statute on interstate extradition gives Governor Ron DeSantis the ability to intervene and even investigate whether an indicted person ought to be surrendered. Which means that as Mar-a-Lago prepares to close down for the season, Trump's going to New Jersey. It isn't just Florida heat he's leaving behind. He could also lose a key piece of political protection because if Trump, of course, if he leaves, if he goes to New Jersey, because it's hot now in Florida, so he leaves for the summer, goes up to New Jersey in Bedminster, and if he gets indicted out of New York, well, he doesn't have a governor in New Jersey who's going to protect him from extradition, according to this article. But if he's in Florida still, well, Ron DeSantis is going to protect him, of course. So we, we now know that Donald Trump is escaping Florida to escape the heat, but he may be putting himself into the lion's trap, into the death, death grip of Cy Vance, a New York Manhattan prosecutor. <gasps> the statute leaves room for interpretation that the governor has the power to order a review and potentially not comply with the extradition notice, says Joe Abruzzo, clerk of the circuit court, who is a meaningless public figure. We're going to see that in a minute. The official who would be in charge of opening a potential fugitive at large case. Folks, this is pornography is really what this is. This is Trump indictment pornography. It's all it is. And we're seeing MSNBC. We're seeing uh, a, a trial lawyer, Katie Fang, very excited about this. Now the Politico is excited about this. Oh my gosh, Ron DeSantis might have to invoke executive privilege to save Donald Trump, that maniac monster, that anti-American insurrectionist from ruining American democracy. He might have to step in and save him. Otherwise, these heroic prosecutors are going to move forward with this indictment and make sure that justice is done. Then we go to Joe Abruzzo, who's, who's down. He is the uh, court clerk for Palm Beach County. Apparently, he's the person who's going to open a fugitive at large case because if the New York Manhattan prosecutor does, in fact, indict Donald Trump, well, now he's going to be a fugitive at large. That's right. The, the 45th president of this country who is responsible, what do you have, 75 million votes? Uh, he's going to be a fugitive at large in America uh, under this current uh, effort, this current attempt from these knuckleheads. One wrinkle in Abrazo's potential role in all of this, well, he's a former close associate of President Joe Biden's younger brother, Frank. Oh, Abrazo tells Playbook that despite his friendship with the Biden family, the full extent of the law will be followed and carried out appropriately without bias. Yeah, right. So no conflict of interest there. If an indictment comes down while Trump is at Bedminster, for the summer, this could all play out differently. New Jersey's extradition statute is similar to Florida's, giving the governor the power to investigate. But the governor in New Jersey is Phil Murphy. He's a Democrat. He's not a fan of Trump, so he's not going to stop the extradition. An attorney for Trump declined to comment because it's an asinine article. It doesn't make any, make any sense at all. It's just basically masturbatory. This is pornography, and you have a bunch of Democrats uh, enjoying themselves over it. The Washington Examiner says the Mueller prosecutor says Trump could be imprisoned in Florida if he's indicted in New York. So another, you know. Bizarre, bizarre thing here says looking ahead, Andrew Weissman, former Justice Department official and FBI counsel also suggested such a situation could limit Trump's ability to inhabit the White House should he run for presidency again, which is really what this is all about. Right. That's the entire basis for the second impeachment it was to make sure he couldn't run again. And there was probably some, you know, corrupt bargain that went down there about, I don't know, not pardoning Snowden or not pardoning Assange in exchange for, you know, not giving the votes to the Republican senators. A lot of, lot of disgusting stuff, I would imagine, happened back then during that second impeachment, but they didn't get what they wanted. Ultimately, Trump can run again in 2024, and so now they want to bring down the hammer of criminal law in order to basically wipe out their political opponents, which is just a bizarre thing, but that's where we're at now. Uh, this uh, this uh, former Justice Department official says this happens all the time in foreign countries where essentially you have people who are sort of imprisoned in a country. Here, Donald Trump would be imprisoned in Florida. Okay. Wiseman said during an appearance on MSNBC, 
during his uh, masturbatory appearance. If he went overseas, he went to, to any other state, he would be subject to those laws. He would really have to stay in Florida. It would certainly be quite an interesting issue if he were to, for instance, this is way down the road, but if he were to try and run again for president, he would not be inhabiting the White House in that situation because there would be papers seeking his extradition to New York. So they are just really excited about this. Wiseman played an instrumental role in winning convictions against Paul Manafort and Rick Gates. Amongst others, we have District Attorney Cyrus Vance looking for bank, bank tax or insurance fraud. The examiner story goes on, says that a Florida statute gives Ron DeSantis some of the ability to prevent him from being excluded. He's a, uh, DeSantis is a former Republican congressman whom Trump has floated as a possible running mate if he runs for the White House again. While he might be opposed to extraditing Trump to New York, the situation gets more complicated with Trump expected to send his summer in a different state in New Jersey. Abruzzo was identified as somebody who will use the law to go against him. Now, Washington Examiner is telling us that Trump's legal team could negotiate a condition of surrender if he is indicted. Oh my gosh, give me a break. Folks, you know, if, if, if Donald Trump is hauled anywhere in handcuffs, a lot of people in this country are going to be very angry about that. It's not a good thing. And it's, this is not sort of an implied veiled threat, right? There's a lot of people who would be very upset about that if, he, if he's, you know, carted off in handcuffs or he's indicted, it would not be good for the country. It would not be good for the Biden administration. They have no interest in doing that, really, in my opinion, because it would really undermine their legitimacy, it would undermine their credibility. It would now be a Biden versus Trump thing. So there's no way that he wants his Justice Department or any of these low level district attorneys to go and prosecute the former president. It's, it's too hot. So it's just not going to happen. All of these people are making political careers about this, right? We're going to go get him. Yeah, we all hate Trump. Orange man bad. Yeah. So that's about as far as it's going to go, I, I would guess. Uh, if I'm wrong, I'll come back here and eat my shorts on it. But I doubt that that is the case. We have Trump organization is also under investigation by New York Attorney General Letitia James. Trump denies any wrongdoing in February, says that this is a new phenomenon of headhunting prosecutors and AGs. I'm not sure that it's that it's necessarily new. I think this has always been the situation, but now it's just been it's sort of more in our faces, right? We can all see it. It's very obvious because it is so transparent. We can see that one side of the country is being treated one way as it comes to a whole sort of a whole variety of different issues, whether it's uh, you know, getting arrested for protesting or whether it's getting access to the vaccine. If you are a certain demographic, if you're a certain political ideology, you get certain benefits that the other side just doesn't get. And I've documented this. We still have people who are not even in the Capitol building who are still in custody as a result of the January 6 riots because the judges there are prosecuting them and they're applying political standards, not legal standards. We have now another story. We're going to follow this up. What is going on with this Abruzzo guy? I mentioned earlier that Abruzzo is out there doing this. Hey, we're going to extradite Donald Trump and we're going to law and order and all this stuff. I'm the clerk of the court. Well, what does that mean? Not much. We're going to look here from Palm Beach Post. We've got some information from some other attorneys. Courts clerk Abruzzo plans for the Trump indictment, but legal experts call the speculation absurd. Well, there it is. It is absurd. This was posted today, May 17, 2021. Clerk of the court, Joe Abruzzo, reiterated on Friday that he has been involved in discussions outlining contingency plans. So is that a good use of their time in the event that former Donald Trump is indicted in Florida? Even as legal experts sniped at the speculation as premature, if not, quote, absurd. In an interview with the Palm Beach Post, following one televised nationally by CNN, okay, they're putting these people all over the media, all over the internet, all over the TV screen, just to sort of have a lot of enjoyment out of this. Donald Trump indictment. How exciting. They have got nothing else to talk about. They're, they're over Liz Cheney. They sort of uh, beat that horse to death for some reason. Nobody even cares about any of that. But all right, now we're 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 back to we're back to Trump again because they can't let it go. We have it says here it is unprecedented, uncharted territory. This is coming from Abruzzo, which is why initial preparation and conversations are extremely important to make the scales of justice stay balanced and beyond reproach. Said Abruzzo. Those talks, Abruzzo said, include how to handle a request by another state to extradite the former president from Palm Beach County if he is charged while he's here or how to respond to governor ron desantis to intervene so he's sort of like war gaming this out i you know planning all the different strategies probably has a cork board up in his office with all the the the, the, the yarn and the strings and the push pins and the images 
What if all this happens? Okay, thank you, Mastermind, for uh, investigating something that's not going to happen. He says, someone not as well known, usually in extradition, will go to their home state where they're a resident, Abrezzo said. In this case, the world knows where the former president is. It would be the first of its kind in the entire process, may see some events that have never happened before. Yeah, like like the indictment. Like that's that's the first event that's not going to happen. Good job. We have Abrezzo. He has no knowledge of Trump's potential indictment. So he's a close associate of Biden's younger brother. But he said he has no knowledge of a potential indictment because right, he doesn't. He's the clerk of the court, particularly in New York. Trump is expected to spend the summer in New Jersey with all the variables at play. We need to. OK, local defense attorneys scoffed at both the timing of the talks and speculation about what would happen if Trump is indicted in New York, as well as the person raising the issue. While Politico described Abruzzo as, quote, the official who would be in charge of opening a potential fugitive at large case, they said Abruzzo's role as clerk is simply to store court records and added, he is not in a decision-making post. <laughs> it's not up to the clerk to do anything, said attorney Greg Lerman. He just holds the records. <laughs> which is true legal so which is absolutely true he's the clerk of the court he's just like a clerical person like he's you know they, they stamp the documents that come in they make sure the records are being maintained this guy's out on cnn literally on cnn like we're gonna go we're gonna extradite donald trump damn it and we're gonna make sure he has no authority to do any of that he's just enjoying himself and the media are enjoying themselves along with him so it's kind of a fun little ride for him i guess legal experts Doubt DeSantis would impede or deny the extradition request. Attorneys fr from both ends of the spectrum said they, wouldn't, they couldn't imagine one of the scenarios Abrezzo suggested. No, because it's asinine. DeSantis stepping in to impede the process in any way. They said the governor is a Harvard-educated lawyer, not a clerk of the court, and doubted he would take the unprecedented step of blocking Trump's extradition. And listen, I got nothing against clerks of the court, okay? I happen to love many of them. Uh, follow many of them on Twitter. Uh, not many of them. One in particular who I'm a big fan of. And, you know, there's, there's, a, a, <laughs> it's just hysterical that this guy's out there now basically sort of giving himself a promotion, like he's going to be the champion of the cause in order to go indict Donald Trump. He has no authority to do that. And everybody else knows that. Everybody else who's working on the ground goes, what, what is he like? The governor? This guy's out there making legal concoctions about DeSantis coming in and they're all wargaming this just having a lot of fun I've never seen a situation where the governor of the state of Florida interferes with a warrant Lerman said like all 50 states Florida is part of an interstate extradition pact it boils down to would the governor want to turn this into a political fight said Lerman he's not a Trump fan I don't think he would look very good except to ultra right-wing cultist Trump supporters said the attorney so the attorney is not even a Trumper the attorney doesn't even like Trump but he says Abrazo is kind of a moron he says attorney Michael Sa attorney Michael Salnick over here says he likes the former president called the entire notion absurd says that's the stuff movies are made of I don't think the governor would block a lawfully extra executed extradition order from another state I think it's crazy I think it's another shot at Mr. Trump I think it's absurd lawyers also question whether DeSantis could block the extradition extradition hearings are typically perfunctory we which is accurate we talked about this with the Kyle Rittenhouse case remember Kyle Rittenhouse uh, went back from Kenosha Wisconsin into Illinois and they extradited him extradited him almost uh, well, not not immediately. It took about two months. So he sat in custody there because his attorneys were idiots and they had no idea what they were doing. Anyways, he got extradited. It was totally formulaic. And uh, I can't believe we're even talking about this. Further, even if DeSantis blocked the extradition, in most cases, high profile people, arrangement, arrangements are made so they simply just turn themselves in. He could hop on a plane, show up in lower Manhattan, plead not guilty, post a bond, go home, let the case run its course which is exactly how it happens with high-profile people. Lehman agreed that someone of Trump's stature would be afforded that opportunity. You would think no matter how big a head he has, he would not want law enforcement to walk into Mar-a-Lago or whatever and drag him out in custody. Neither does the country. Okay, do you imagine, can you imagine how angry a lot of people would be if you saw Donald Trump walking out in handcuffs? Would not go well. Noted constitutional lawyer Bruce Rogow said he reads political story and then he quickly dismissed it. He said, it's too weird. Too many things would have to happen for me to even bother with it but they are excited about it they love the idea donald trump indicted <gasps> oh my gosh a lot of a lot of uh a lot of people on the other side of the aisle are all a twitter right now we have sarah smothers says i like how they have nothing to report now that trump is out of office so they're bringing him back that's <laughs> there's nothing to talk about what are you going to talk about kamala harris's border successes there's stock market you know that's 
looking good up up and down it's looking good until it isn't good i guess we have liberty or death says these dorks should research president trump he had paid tuition for private undergrad had and law and medical school for a lot of people he never met yeah yeah he did they're they're just trying to find an angle they need any angle where they can show a direct connection so they're literally investigating grandkids at a private school or maybe not them specifically right they're not going in there hey little johnny we're going to check your bank account to see if donald trump put any bad money in there they're just going to go and request all the records but you can just see the extent to the, to what they're trying to do is this is this a legitimate prosecution anymore or is this a political prosecution i think we know we have mestizo quixote in the house says they are still trying everything they can to keep him from running again in 2024 i'm not a trump fan but the current democratic power trip is making trump an increasingly appealing candidate for 2024 yeah, people may miss him. People may start to miss him sooner rather than later. We're going to see. Liberty or death is in the house, says. So do they actually think that the Secret Service would allow this? Or do they think the Secret Service will go to jail with him? He pays tuition for his worker's kid. But President Clinton can sell Chinese missile technology through Johnny Cheng. Yeah, well, Clinton can do a lot, right? Clinton can actually change. She, she can actually be in total violation of government policies regarding storing her emails on a server. There are very important reasons why we do not allow that to happen. Things like public transparency, number one, so that we can see what you're doing. It's all public record. But also things like, I don't know, national security, so that they don't hack in. We already know that they shut down a pipeline. They wrecked a, a lot of different facilities through solar winds. Maybe they could access, you know, clintonemail.com and a storage a server that was stored in a closet somewhere. But... As I said, these upper echelon people, they do not get in trouble. They just, they, they escape it because we saw what happened. Remember James Comey? He was investigating Hillary Clinton and he kind of wrote a memo that said that what she was doing was extremely reckless or, or something that was criminal, right? It was extremely reckless. It was, it met that threshold. Then when he had to write his memo, just went back in there and changed it, deleted the extremely reckless and made it like, largely careless so if, so criminally it would have been extremely reckless well that's the standard that the law set and he said that she met that standard but then modified the motion a little bit modified his memo and said oh no no it wasn't extreme carelessness it was just uh it wasn't extreme recklessness it was just largely careless or whatever the language was i'm mi mixing up the words but just adjusted the standard and then when he sent that over to the doj they go oh well that language doesn't meet the standard so we can't charge her with anything so oh darn it well well, now you know, Hillary, don't do that again. And so she just gets to go away scot-free. Now, you can say that, you know, Trump uh, is, on a, is, is not the same thing. You can say that Trump is in a different category, and this is a political prosecution. But the point remains, people at this level of power, they don't have anything to worry about. We have Nadar Blasir says, at what point is it considered harassment when the government is constantly trying to find a new way to indict someone? without any cause you know it's a really good point and it's a good question and i think that we're probably going to be getting close to that pretty soon you know i don't know what the legal standard is because i've never seen actually something like this happen i've never seen this come down the pike where you know the government is overly harassing one client just constantly we haven't seen anything like that i've seen stalking i've seen police stalk people and follow people and you know we have to sort of um write sternly worded letters to different uh, entities throughout Arizona about what to do about that. And then some things will happen, but what do you do if it's the federal government and it's the administration and the DOJ that say, well, we're just going to sink all of our resources into this effort. Scary. This is why elections have consequences. Sharon Quitney's in the house says if anybody had any doubts that we are witnessing a communist takeover and purge, we have your first and second segments exhibits a, and be ish uh, i hope not well we're going to do what we can to push back against that sharon we have mestizo quixote says i suspect they want an uprising of some kind gives them an excuse to label all trump supporters domestic terrorists that would be like the worst thing that could happen if donald trump gets put in handcuffs and you have an uprising in this country that would not be good which is why it's not going to happen they, they're, they're not going to let that happen our, our last question on this says is coming from patriot musk says rob Still think there won't be a full-scale civil war. I think we'll be seeing rockets flying, a new anthem, and a new flag in the future. Yeah, Patriot. I don't want a civil war, right? We don't want any civil war. We want no violence. Now, if we have a soft decoupling, right? If we say, well, we don't like how some of these things are going, maybe we just pick up and move and relocate 
to different locations. Call it soft decoupling, not a civil war. We don't want that. That's too violent. We don't want any violence, no violence here. But good to see you, Patriot Musk. I'm really hopeful that we're not going that direction, but we'll see. Thank you for those questions over from watching the watchers. Locals.com. Love the support. Really appreciate it. And lastly, we're going to change gears. We're going to talk about Kim Potter. Kim Potter, the former police officer who was accused allegedly of shooting and killing Dante Wright. Pretty sure she did. We saw it happen. This was happening right in the middle of the Chauvin trial. If you recall this, Kim Potter was an officer who stopped Dante Wright, very young man who was in his teens, I believe, 20 years, years old, Dante Wright, stopped on the side of the road, and they were about to make an arrest. And as Dante Wright was sort of, uh, you know, tr uh, they were trying, the officers were trying to get him to comply, he threw his arm out and tried to get back in the vehicle and flee on the side of the road. Kim Potter, who was a training officer at the time, thought that she was pulling out her taser to shoot and detain him, pulled out her gun, shot, killed him. So he drove off further, uh, basically died right there on the side of the road. And his girlfriend, I think, was in the car. So this was happening right in the middle of the Chauvin trial. And this was a problem for the Chauvin trial because there were a lot of people who were angry about this. There were protests that were taking place. This was in the national news yet again, and it caused a lot of turmoil in Minneapolis because it happened right outside of Minneapolis. Well, Kim Potter was in court today. She had her first court date. She had what's called an arraignment today, and it was an omnibus hearing. So a lot of activity, a lot of flurry of, of, of court documents being sent back and forth. We're going to go through some of them today so we can kind of get ourselves caught up to speed on where the Kim Potter case stands today. Now, the trial is not going to be scheduled at least now until the end of the year. Judge said it's going to be loosely, tentatively scheduled for December. We'll see whether or not that happens. We know that there is still a lot of chaos. That's, I don't know if it's chaos anymore, but a lot of, let's say, tension that is in Minneapolis as a result of the Chauvin trial. We know that Judge Cahill continued out the cases, extended those, pushed those back for the other three officers that were with Derek Chauvin on the date of the May incident in 2020 involving George Floyd. So the question then becomes, is this going to be something that can take place in December? Or is the scene going to be too, too tumultuous? Is there going to be too much turmoil in Minneapolis that's going to require Kim Potter's case to also be continued, just like the other three officers? We also have to ask ourselves this question. Hey, Minneapolis, right? They're, they're going to be running out of police officers pretty soon because we've got now five of them who are being charged with crimes right outside of Minneapolis. We've got the four Chauvin and Floyd officers. Now we have Kim Potter. Kim Potter was in court today. She, of course, is an ex-police officer who fatally shot the motorist, Dante Wright. Judge said trial is going to go forward. Very, very preliminary court date today. Hennepin County judge, we have Regina M. Chu. So we're going to have some new faces here. She said during a virtual omnibus hearing on Monday that she found probable cause to support the charges against Potter. Set trial date tentatively for December 6. We'll see if that goes. After a brief delay over technical difficulties, Chu started the hearing, the judge, by offering condolences to the Wright's family who were there in virtual attendance. We have special assistant Hennepin County Prosecutor Imran Ali, which we did not hear from in the... Chauvin trial, so this is somebody else they're bringing in, raised concerns about the trial start date, citing the amount of discovery and the witness selection that the state has ahead of it. And I'm going to show you this. We're going to look at the discovery documents. These are called disclosure documents. So we've got a list, a lot. A, there is a lot here, a lot more than I was even expecting. We have all sorts of chain, training records and a lot of different witness statements, actually, more than I was expecting. And I'm going to show you what all is in there. We have like uh, four pages of, of a list of just documents. Then we have audio, we have video, we have uh, some other exhibits that are being disclosed. I'm going to show you all of that. But the point here is that the special assistant Hennepin County prosecutor Imran Ali is saying there's a lot and we need some more time to get through it. Not so sure that December 6 is going to work out for us. The article continues. Again, this comes over from, where did I get this article? Uh, Washington Post says, I think it's to the benefit of everyone to try to expedite this case and to try to come up with a resolution or trial as quickly and as reasonably as possible, said the judge. And I would expect, if I had to guess, I would expect that there will be a plea deal in this case. I'm not so sure that this is going to go to a trial. I'm not really sure what the tribal issue is, unless she is going to be claiming that... Uh, we, we did a defense video on her. We did a you know defending the indefensible-ish type of video on that, and she... They're, they're, I, th I, think, I think that the only defense in this case is really that she was entitled to shoot him at that time. That even though she used the taser as a mistake, if she would have used her gun, that would have been legal. And the, the legal theory there 
is that he was fleeing, right? And he was driving a car. So he would have been somebody who could, could have theoretically been a danger to other persons, to other parties out there in society. And so if the police just let him get away, because he's fleeing, he is now fleeing in a car, which turns the car into a deadly weapon, which could theoretically kill somebody who is innocent out there on the roadway. So Kim Potter then, by extension, as a law enforcement officer, in order to stop that threat, can use deadly force to protect a third party. That's the legal theory that I think is probably her best, maybe her only shot at overcoming uh, at least one of the charges. Uh, I'd have to look at the charges again. But back when we did our analysis, that was the defense that, yes, this was a mistake, probably negligent, but she could have shot him. She actually could have done that. And the fact that she did, even though it was a mistake, wasn't unlawful because she was stopping him from killing, hypothetically, somebody else. I know it's a stretch, but it's one theory. Potter, 48, was dressed in a black shirt. She appeared from the office of her defense attorney, Earl Gray. She did not speak apart from acknowledging that she consented to the hearing taking place virtually. Here's her mugshot from back in the day. Potter, who is white, has not appeared in court since April 15th, the day after she was charged with second degree manslaughter for the shooting of Wright, who is black during a traffic stop in Brooklyn Center. And you recall there were protests there, right? The previous week, Chauvin was still there. Uh, Potter had been a police officer for 26 years until she resigned over the shooting. She's remained free on bond. Monday's hearing marked the latest development in a case that drew significant national attention just as the trial of Derek Chauvin played out 10 miles away. In the days after the death, suburban Brooklyn Center was rocked by days of protest that at times unspooled into violent clashes with police. And we know this because we know that that alternative juror the woman who came out and gave that first interview, the first juror to come out and publicly speak, she also gave us a bunch of her notes, right? And she was traveling back and forth between the courthouse in Hennepin County and Brooklyn Center, where all the protests were taking place. And so people who were watching the Chauvin trial were throwing their arms up in the air saying, see, this is why this is not a fair and impartial trial. Trial, the venue should have been moved. It should have been relocated because what's happening here is we have jurors traveling to and from the courthouse who are being improperly influenced by these riots, by these external protests that are obviously political. And they have a direct correlation to what is taking place in the Chauvin trial. It's about police brutality. It's about police who happen to be white killing a man who happens to be black. Or if you want to take it further, it's intentional. It's a racist white cop killing a black man intentionally. We have a very similar set of facts in the Dante Wright Kim Potter shooting taking place 10 miles away from the Chauvin trial might be worth voidering the jurors again, might be worth investigating what is happening here and whether it ultimately imbiased or improperly imbiased the final verdict. So the question that I had, since we're in the same county, we're still in the same court, we're in Hennepin County, we're in the state of Minnesota, we're in the fourth judicial district. We, uh, are we going to watch this whole thing? Are we going to be able to see everything like we did with the Derek Chauvin trial? Maybe, but not quite yet. So first of all, uh, we have an objection from Kimberly Potter. You can see this here. This was filed on May 10th. So we're just getting caught up here. Kim Potter says that through her counsel, she gives notice that she objects to cameras in the courtroom for the hearing that took place today, right? So no cameras in the courtroom. She objected, signed off on by her, her uh, attorney, Earl Gray. Now we know that the judge accepted that. So this was the order that came out on May 11th. It says the above matter came before Judge Chu on the request by various media outlets. And so a lot of the media want to come in and watch this whole thing, of course. Rule 402 says, yeah, we can allow that with the consent of all the parties. Defendant here objected during a scheduling call. The state, however, they consented. They're, the state's perfectly okay with this. The omnibus hearing then shall be open to the public and media is welcome to attend via Zoom, but no audio visual coverage. That is denied. So we're going to see if that continues. The judge did say that, uh, that, that audio visual coverage or the state today filed uh, a request that the trial is open. We're going to see if the defense objects to that and we're going to see what the judge says about it. So let's take a look at some of this disclosure that just came out. This came out today. Early this morning, 9.53 a.m. back in Minnesota, we're talking about disclosure. So quick framing of what this means, how this works. When you are a criminal defendant, you're somebody who's being charged with a crime. That means the government is prosecuting you. Okay, The government has all of the evidence. Literally, they have the police department, 
They have all the crime labs. They have all the forensic, uh, you know, kits. They have all of the evidence locker rooms. They have it all. It's all in their possession. All the body cameras are recorded to their devices. They own all the police vehicles, everything. So if you're a defendant, well, you need the government to tell you what they have and they better be honest about it. They better tell you everything. They better give you everything that they've got. And if they don't, if they keep something out, if they don't give you something that might be exculpatory, meaning it might show that you're innocent, it might tend to prove that you didn't in fact commit the crime. If they have possession of that and they're supposed to give it to you, if they don't, it's a huge problem. So we have these really strict rules surrounding discovery. And the defense, by the way, also has to disclose stuff to the government. We have to tell them. These are our expert witnesses. This is who we're going to call in. This guy is going to come in and talk about blood results. This guy is going to come in and talk about uh, a, a, a sex kit, a sex exam. We have all different expert witnesses, forensic accountants and digital technologists and all sorts of, all, all sorts of different people that we use. And so we have to disclose that to the government so that they know what evidence we have and what we're planning. We want to know the same thing from the government. So pretty standard stuff. Now, in this case, there is a lot of it. Let me show you what's happening here. We have supplemental prosecution disclosure. This was sent over this morning, 5-17-9-53 a.m., County of Hennepin, Minnesota, versus Kimberly Ann Potter. Pursuant to Rule 9, which must be their sort of disclosure rules, uh, please find supplemental disclosure incorporating all previous disclosures. Okay, so this is just one additional supplement. So there's, you have sort of an initial round of disclosure, and then everything after that is supplemental, supplemental, supplemental. So we're going to see a ton, a ton of discovery coming out in this case. But remember what happened here. Again, this was a side of the road shooting. There was a girlfriend in the car. Dante Wright was there. We have the officer, Kim Potter. We have her partner. We have body cameras from a couple different angles. And this was on the side of the road. So presumably we have other people who stopped and saw. And it was a shooting. And so we're going to have you know, medical exams, uh, autopsy reports, a lot of information here. Let's take a look at what the government is disclosing today. You're going to see. It's a lot. Here we have it. This is from uh, subsection A. We've got crime scene receipts, photographs, Kim Potter, Sergeant Johnson. We've got property receipt, handguns. We have uh, body-worn cameras from an officer. We have evidence receipt of a blood kit. Okay, so uh, they, they, they must have drawn blood from uh, maybe, maybe both officers. We have a laboratory, oh no, blood kit maybe from Dante Wright. So a laboratory analysis, medical personnel cer certificate, transcripts from an Aaron Longting interview. So look, I mean, look at all these different interviews. We have Jason Blansky, D. Thau, Brandon Thau. We have Liana Mob Cobb, Brandon Thau, a disc of the surety video clips. Look at this stuff. Carrie Blansky, Duvang, lots, lots of stuff. Then we get over here, we've got uh, additional statements, we have a Diane Lodermeyer interview. We have blood prep kit card, medical exam and evidence receipt, mobile video recorders. So we have all these different policies. Look, we have the BC, so that must be the Brooklyn Center Police Department policy. So we've got video recording policies, officer involved shootings and deaths. This is 11 pages. Conducted energy device, must be the taser policy, control devices, another sort of uh, you know less than lethal use of force. And we have the use of force policy. So we've got a lot of documents here that are all Brooklyn County policies. We've got iPhones, uh, SS Max, XS Max, radio traffic of the incidents, Officer Dan Irish interview. We have Casey Abukar supplemental report. Look at that. It just goes on and on. North Memorial Health EMS. We have USB drives. List goes on and on. Look at all these different officers. Hader, Dunwell, Buck, Donahue, Lazenbury, Maganana. We've got uh, call logs. We have taser logs. We have property and application and search warrant receipts. So they went through everything. Interview of all these different officers. Look at all these different officers who were involved. We have Sergeant Johnson, more search warrants. And folks, this is still on documents. This is still documents. Look, we have po uh, Potter took some performance evaluation. So this will be interesting. We got some mis miscellaneous information about her. We have an application evaluation, 52 page evaluation of her. 46 pages for one performance evaluation, 34 on another, training certificates back from 2017, 2019, one, uh, uh, then all the way back to 1996. She was disciplined. We got nine pages of discipline records. Oh, we got 29 pages of commendations, training certificates, more uh, uh, commendations. We have performance evaluations, cell data, photos of her taser and duty belt. All right, I'm just reading a list at this point. But the point is there is a lot here. Let me show you, we'll wrap this up. We have some audio. So we've got some radio audio. We have uh, different reports. We've got time codes at the end of here. So all audio recordings. Then we have body worn cameras. 
So we've got Lucky, Potter, Lucky, Potter, Lucky, Potter. So we'll have two officers who have that. Then we have photos of the gun belt, photos of the scene, photos of the two cops, doorbell videos. I wonder what that's from. Surveillance videos and from the crime scene. So yeah, they must have gotten here signed off on by Imran Ali. Must have gotten warrants, probably went and searched her place, Dante's place. Who knows how extensive this whole thing was, but lots lots of discovery let's take a quick look over at some questions from watching the watchers.locals.com i know this was a short segment we'll see if we have any uh, first one here is mestizo quixote says the public comments from juror 52 forget his name is brandon mitchell from the chauvin trial should clinch the argument for changing the venue of every trial of a minneapolis police officer it seems increasingly unlikely that they will be able to assemble an impartial jury in that city yeah i mean maybe even for the foreseeable future it is really really volatile right there and we now know this because the judge granted a continuance for the other three officers which of course begs the question if those three officers got that continuance why didn't Derek Chauvin good question isn't it judge is going to have to answer that and I think that the prosecutors uh, will as well and We'll see what the judge has to say about it. So I want to say a welcome to a couple new members who joined us over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. What's up, Aunt M? Welcome to the community and Fair Lady as well. Welcome to you both, Aunt M and Fair Lady. They signed up over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com to support the community and the show, and I really appreciate that. I mean that. We have uh, some people who asked some great questions today. Thank you to all of you. You know who you are, and if you are not already a subscriber, over at locals well what the heck are you doing go get it go look there's a great stuff over there i can't even speak that's how excited i am we have beginning to winning it's a book that you can download i wrote it it's for free download the pdf if you join up over at watching the watchers.locals.com you can also download a copy of the slides that we went through a copy of the impeachment party documents copy of my existence system uh, personal productivity device we have links and conversations that you can share and you can meet great people when you get over there a couple quick dates i want to ping we have our monthly locals meetup which is happening via zoom so we're going to meet face to face uh, but you can keep your camera off if you want that's happening on saturday going to be this saturday may 22nd 7 p.m eastern time we're going to go for one hour we're just going to say hi okay no pressure at all we're just, hey how's it going good to see you Good to see you. Good to see you, Liberty. Good to see you, Pinky. Good to see you. We're just going to say hello. That's all. No pressure. Come join us Saturday, this Saturday, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Then next month, June 12th at 12 noon Eastern time, we're going to have law enforcement interaction training totally free if you are a supporter over at locals.com and are watching the watchers page. We're going to talk about the basics of interacting with law enforcement. What happens if they pull you over? What happens if they come to their house, your house? What happens if they call you on the phone? A lot that we can get into. And so we're very excited about that Saturday, June 12th at noon Eastern time. So hopefully you can join us. And lastly, one of the most important things that I do, of course, is I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I am a founding partner here at the r, &R Law Group. We're located in Scottsdale, Arizona, and we are very passionate about helping good people facing criminal charges to find safety, clarity, and hope in their cases and hopefully in their lives. And so if you happen to know anybody in the state of Arizona who is facing a criminal charge, we would be honored and humbled if you sent them our way. We're very good at what we do. We can help anybody who's facing criminal charges in the state of Arizona with anything, any type of criminal charge, DUI, drugs, domestic violence, felonies, misdemeanors, traffic cases, doesn't matter. Old cases, if you have an old warrant you want to quash, if you have a, a, an old conviction that you just want to expunge, if you want to restore your rights so that you can vote again or go possess a firearm or go apply for some federal benefits, if you just want to clean your record up so that the next time you're applying for a job, you don't have to check that box that says, yes, I've been convicted. We can help with that. We can remove mugshots off the internet. We can do it all. We're very good at it. We're passionate as hell about it. And so if you happen to know anybody who could use some of those services. I mean it. I would be honored and humbled if you trusted us enough to send them our way. We'll make sure they leave our office better than they found us. They can grab a copy of my book and we'll do our very best to make sure that we can move them beyond this difficult and tumultuous time in their lives and on to the next episode, just like we're going to do here because we're going to be back here tomorrow, same place, same time. It's going to be at 4 p.m. Arizona time, which is 5 p.m. Mountain, which is 6 p.m. Central, which is 7 p.m. on the East Coast. And for that one Florida man out there, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in today on this lovely Monday. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Have a great night. Bye-bye.